Hello and welcome to this review of my Chaconi KB5160 AT keyboard. I actually have two of these, but one's not so interesting because that one comes with Futaba MA, which I've covered multiple times before, but this other one comes with Cherry MX White, specifically the original version, so this is much more intriguing. To be honest, I've wanted to do an MX White review for quite a while because it was kind of a gap in my review list, to be honest. Now, before the pendants go, well, <laughs> actually, that's Cherry MX Clear. No, this is what MX White looked like before MX Clear was brought out, because whites preceded clears. Later, they made the sliders more opaque to make the distinction clearer. Oh, <laughs> see what I did there? However, there is actually a way to distinguish early whites from clears, and that's this little pip on the slider. This would be retained for MX Blue, which still have that pip to this day. See, MX Whites are basically the same as MX Blues, with some grease in them to shut up the horrible clicking sound a bit. But what's interesting here is that MX Whites aren't the dampened version of MX Blues, but MX Blues came later, so actually MX Blue are the noisified version of MX White. Now this might sound weird, but the pattern gives some insight as to what happened here. A patent always shows a clear outline of demands placed on products in the current state of the art and how the patent aims to improve on those. Now Cherry claimed the switch to be low profile, which might sound weird, but it was definitely true in 1983, tactile, which was another thing manufacturers aspire to, and that it had hysteresis, which is desirable from an engineering perspective. However, there is no mention at all of a clicky noise or audible feedback, despite that this was definitely a thing, quite sought after even, at that time. In fact, because of the growing popularity of clicky switches, like IBM's buckling spring design, which are older and which do clearly outline an intended audible feedback in their patent, Cherry eventually redesigned MX White to produce a clicky sound, resulting in MX Blue. But it would very much seem that this switch wasn't originally intended to be clicky, it just happened to be so, and they dampened it with some grease to remove the apparently undesirable sound which I can very much relate to because MX Blue sound hideous. So next time someone with an MX Blue board tries to defend the revolting racket their board puts out, you can tell them that even Cherry themselves apparently hated the sound of them so much that they greased them at first just to get rid of the hateful plastic rattling that these fuckers produce. Instead, it seems that originally the switches were designed for hysteresis rather than clickiness. Hysteresis essentially means that the switch doesn't make at the same point where it breaks. Instead, there's a gap between the two points. This is considered desirable because not having it means that you can accidentally tease the contact into rapid triggering. The way they implemented it is through a sliding collar, which is often referred to as a click jacket, although I guess a more appropriate name would be a hysteresis collar when you think of it. The idea is that the slider moves more freely through the collar than the collar does across the contacts because the contacts cause more friction. So this collar stays in place for a bit during the downstroke of the key. In other words, it takes a bit longer for the key to reset, which is what hysteresis in effect is. This is in contrast to the non-clicky MX switches on which the slider is a single part and in which you can tease the contacts by hovering near the contact point. This is deemed to be undesirable because it's more prone to unwanted input, although nowadays hysteresis is considered a disadvantage by some hardcore gamers who actually like the ability to more rapidly activate their switches in quick succession. I imagine the Osu crowd, as usual, will be furiously typing comments regarding this by now. <laughs> Now this board, the 5160, is very old. It'll be a mid to late 80s production, so the grease is dried up and is not in good condition anymore, especially because the board itself wasn't exactly clean. And so it'll come as no surprise that the grease doesn't actually dampen the sound at all anymore. It pretty much just sounds like MX Blue right now. It's only slightly muffled at best, really. Now, do keep in mind that this is a rather noisy chassis, so it'll be a bit softer in a modern case. Now, the switches in this one, somewhat ironically, considering that the whole point was that they had hysteresis to prevent accidental multi-triggering, chatter like crazy. They trigger two, three, or very occasionally even four times per key press. 
Not all switches have it, but a bunch of them do, and most annoyingly, this includes both the spacebar and the backspace keys, which makes it extremely difficult to not make any mistakes, because you'll keep ending up over-spacing and then over-correcting and then over-spacing again, and so forth and so on. I'm sure that this wasn't an issue when the board was new, but by now it's so terrible that I haven't actually done a standard week-long testing period, but instead a few hours every once in a while, because it's absolutely unbearable in its current state. Next up is the build quality of the keyboard. Now, most Chaconi chassis aren't all that tough, you know, serviceable, but not great. And this one is no exception. It's okay-ish, but really nothing spectacular, especially compared to other keyboards from this time. The case is plastic and it does have a metal mounting plate, but the mold quality isn't great and it feels really floppy. Look at this. And I mean, this is not even that big a keyboard. Good enough to hold its own. I mean, these are still going after 35 or so years, and it's immensely better than one of Cherry's own chassis, of course, which aren't much better than a cardboard box, but it doesn't feel luxurious in any way or anything. It weighs, not counting the cable, almost exactly 1100 grams, or in Imperial units, you know, diabetes. The keycaps are a rather strange case. The Futaba version doesn't use Futaba's own inverse cross mount, but Cherry's MX mount instead, so they both use the same mount, but the Cherry one uses double shots, whereas the Futaba one is pad printed. The mold also looks a little bit different. I'm not really quite sure what happened here. Anyway, they're both thin ABS. More specifically, I think that the Futaba model uses a more modern revision of keycap style, including having non-stepped keycaps and OEM profile. Like other Chaconi keyboards, it could come with a wide variety of switches. Apparently, Chaconi had absolutely no concept of brand loyalty. The 5160 has been found so far with MX Black, MX Blue and MX White, Futaba MA, Green Alps, Blue Alps, Omrons and Mitsumi Miniature Mechanical. So they could come with light and stiff linears from different manufacturers, tactile switches or four different types of clicky switches from three different brands. I'm surprised they even committed to giving it a model number to be honest. I mean, they might as well have just called it a keyboard with some switches in it. Admittedly, the box, yes, I own the original box for one of these, does look exceptionally generic and bland, though. So at least it wasn't marketed as being the second coming or anything. The layout, for those who are wondering, is a copy of the IBM PC AT layout. This is rather antiquated, and it's the source of the big-ass enter that's often associated with Chinese keyboards, as they kept using it, whereas American and European layouts gradually shifted to ANSI and ISO enters after the introduction of the Model M in 1985. An annoying trait of the AT layout is the tiny backspace key, and I never really liked having control here, but I know a lot of Unix users do, because they're weird. The spacebar, for those who were wondering, by the way, is 9.75 units long, over half again as long as a modern 6-unit spacebar. Might sound rather excessive, but this was actually standard at the time. After all, there were no Windows keys yet, and only single control and alt keys. Here, let me show you what it sounds like. It also had no separate arrow keys yet, instead you had to use the numpad. But one of the more notable and curious quirks of the AT layout is that the numpad also has the escape key on it here, which I'm sure worked well at the time, but it's kind of crap now, especially if you play games where you have to exit a lot of windows, like Tarkov. It leads to all kind of fuckery around. Overall, the AT layout is rather dated, in some ways more so than the XT layout that preceded it. It's not the end of the world, especially with some practice you can get used to it fairly well, but of course a more modern layout is nicer, although it is fairly compact compared to a vintage full size. To be specific, including its rather fat bezels, it's 46 by 19 centimeters big. Or in Imperial units, ain't nobody needin' no stinker metric units or nothing which is roughly the size of a modern full-size, by the way, so it's not actually all that space-saving overall. 
In the end, it's a fairly generic, although admittedly not bad looking, vintage keyboard with meh switches in bad condition. It's a fun look back into the history of early 80s computing, but if I had to recommend someone a vintage keyboard, this wouldn't be it. At the very least, I'd rather recommend its larger, full-size brother, the KB5161, and different switches such as Blue Alps. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.